We can show a little clip of it or, or something, but nothing about actors interacting with it. I guess it does in some ways come, come down to actors. But the, this global idea is, is incredible to me because I've traveled in Greece and Russia and, and Poland and, uh, and all of those places I've done some classes or what have you, and um, their, uh, their ways are very open. You know, um, the Russian school that I was at and the, and the Polish uh, theater companies uh, are very, it's almost like we are more parochial, we have a more limited way of looking at it than almost any other country I can think of. Like Berlin, none of this is really an issue in Berlin. Berlin is like right at the fore of all of this. Of course, most other countries would agree that we're, I mean, that we, some of our policies would act, would seem to imply that we sort of think we're at the center and maybe we're not listening to the rest of the world as deeply as would be important to do. And, uh, you know, in the theater we always used to say, if you're thinking about who's in the audience or how we get people in, and people would say, well, do they see themselves up on the stage? Are we putting people's, are, can they relate? And that was sort of our job, we thought, I think, to put people on the stage and their stories that the audience could under identify with. And mm -hmm. I heard someone say, and I'm forgetting who it is, that maybe that's not really our primary job anymore, that maybe mm -hmm. our primary job is to put up on the stage not the people, not who people are and know in the audience, but the, well, who they don't know from you know other cultures, other people around the world, whatever, that the theaters, one of the theaters jobs may be to bring the wide world of other into knowingness. Into knowingness, <laughs> well said. Do you, are you facing this? You're, you're a director of very, of great note, and your and you're work, you do a lot of movement work. Are you able to record your work and uh, show it? Does, is that an issue for you ever, or are you? Yeah, um, I think that, I, I mean, I, I'm not allowed to tape my work under certain equity codes. I am able to tape it when you move up a few contracts, um, and then you're able to, to keep a record of it, but um, it's... So you can I, do it archivally. You do it archivally. You're allowed to tape something archivally. I, I, I don't want to misspeak and say the wrong yeah. thing mm -hmm. that I, I've been involved in, but I, I know that I've not been allowed to do it, and I have been allowed to do it, and it depends on what equity contract I'm on. Or sometimes you're only allowed to tape 10 minutes, and sometimes you're only allowed to... It, it, it Usually varies. it's that you cannot show any scene in its entirety. You can have 10 minutes of taping overall, but not more than... Uh, Something like a minute and a half. I mean, it's very, very. Right. Well, and when you do. Do you think it will, Jackson? Yeah. Jackson, I, this is Jackson Breyer, who's the president of our board. Well, full disclosure. I'm in University of Maryland. <clears throat> I'm involved in an organization in Washington, D.C., which, as many of you know, has a very thriving community of theater. And it's called the Washington Area Performing Arts Video Archive. It's the only mm -hmm. uh, archive of live theater outside of. And it's an interesting situation because uh, it seems to me, now you guys who are equity people know more about this, it seems to me the obstacle is not entirely equity. It's not. Because it's not, equity no. now, I think, begins to realize that they've got to come into the 21st <coughs> century. And that's what I mean when I say eventually it's going to change. I hope so. Let me explain what happens in D.C. Mm -hmm. We Please. literally can take any equity production in D.C. Uh, once we get the permission of the actors mm -hmm. who are in the production. Mm -hmm. Entre nous, we've never really dealt with the other unions involved, which we probably should, mm -hmm. but there's not been any problem. Right. The problem, incidentally, and perhaps some of you can anticipate this, we don't have a lot of money. Right. So we have tried very hard to get theaters some of which are extraordinarily wealthy theaters, like Arena Stage and the mm -hmm. Shakespeare Theater, with 
millions of dollars in budget to agree to help us take these shows, which we will then archive, and they don't want to spend the money hmm. taking the shows. You know, the artistic, you know, Ari Roth, the late Ari Roth, uh, would say... Not not literally late. Uh, no, no, late. no longer artistic yeah, director yeah, at the moment. Would say theater to now a, artistic director of a new theater. Yes, yeah. he has his own theater. You know, Ari would say, so it roughly costs us about 800 to to $1,000 to archive a show. Mm -hmm. and we're talking to theaters that have $15 million budget. Yes, I dare and say. Ari Roth would say, if I had $1,000, I'm not going to put it in taping. I'm going to put it into the show I'm putting on. On stage, yeah. Stage. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think the big question is when you're, when you're archiving a piece of live performance, like, not to be crass, but like, what's the point? And, like, and I think that's like a really important question. And I think a lot of the time, and I mean a lot of regional theater shows I've designed, they come in and they do an archival taping. I would actually say the majority. And then that tape goes into a file cabinet somewhere where no one has access to it. And so I think a lot of it, even when the union contracts, like I know I'm, I'm not equity because I'm a designer, but I'm part of United Scenic Artists. And so our, most of our collective bargaining, bargaining agreements allow for archival tapings, but you actually can't do anything with them other than keep them in the office of the theater. Mm -hmm. And someone can then go physically view them in person at that theater's office, mm -hmm. which like, why, if I'm a theater, I don't even know why I would bother spending $1,000 to tape a show. No one's gonna come to my office and watch it on mm -hmm. my laptop. Like that actually doesn't do me as a theater good. I guess it does theatrical historians good, you know, 50 years from now or 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. Now archiving is a very difficult thing to sell. But, yeah. and, mm -hmm. but I think you also look at, you know, organizations like the Metropolitan Opera, which are doing these like direct to theater things. And now there's this like really clear like, okay, well we can, we can archive it. And not only that, we can make money off of it in the short term because now rather than you having to see Metropolitan Opera shows by like going to New York and buying very expensive tickets and going to the opera, you can watch it from a movie theater in like Independence, Kansas. Um, and maybe not Independence. Maybe well, not Independence. Well, Kansas. Close, but, but I mean, I was in Ox I was in Mississippi, but, and like you could watch. Uh, like I worked on the Ring Cycle at the Met, and like I was in Oxford, Mississippi, and saw it on a movie screen there rather than seeing it in New York because of like my travel plans. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. But but for instance, this is an issue for us here at the at the William Inch Cent at the Inch Center, because we have archives of, of 34 years of incredible workshops and conversations and tributes to the, the honorees, you know, the most distinguished writers in American theater. And unless you come to independence, you can't, we, we can't make use of that. And the, my fondest hope for this place is that the whole thing cracks way open. I've said that twice now. Um, like a big egg, because I think if we could put it out there, it is an invaluable resource for artists. And, and theater has always been a, an art form which was uh, apprenticed, and you learned from others about how to do it, and you had master teachers, and, and we, we have a fundamental, uh, I feel, responsibility to sort of give that stuff out. And we can't. And, that, and, and being in the position I'm in right now, I'm really frustrated by that. So. Well, there are, I mean, I, I'm not going to try to speak for what oh, the on. actors no. or, the, or uh, the other artists should rightfully benefit. I mean, I, yeah. I understand that's a big yeah. and difficult question, and of I'm course, not yeah. able to really address it. But in terms of we know that every industry, I mean, if you're not online, if you're not able to, it's communicating. Uh, if you're not able to as an industry, uh, I would not feel particularly hopeful about the future of that industry. Mm -hmm. And the, um, there's so, as far as taping, there's so many different, but archiving is one use, and to archive a production, you may need some co certain kind of, maybe you have a single handheld camera, I mean, you know, one camera, you're just archiving it. Mm -hmm. But if you want, to, and if you were doing it for a major movie, presentation obviously mm -hmm. that's a whole other ball game mm -hmm. and in between there there are a lot of a lot of gradations I mean if mm -hmm. you're doing if you're doing it to develop a work with other companies in other countries you wouldn't uh, just want to be taping a final product you're 
you're sharing back and forth as you go along throughout the development process. I mean, you would really, to do the kind of international development project base, you need, I would think, a fairly free hand in terms of being able to share things back and forth um, just as you go along as well as the final product. Mm -hmm. I mean, almost any stricture uh, would seem to be pretty limiting. I have a question. So do you find in, in your experience, or really all of you, that the unions are cracking down on this? Or do you find that because of the way the technology and the culture is changing, that in many cases they're turning more of a blind eye? As long as you're not, you know, broadcasting it for profit and that sort of thing. I, I feel like there's this bit of a stigma about the whole thing because <coughs> The second I'm doing, like I just did a project that happened to be all non-union actors. Just it just was where I was, and and I have the whole thing, you know. Um, I guess maybe it's partially my thing because being in that union also, I I don't feel like I can even I don't even go there. I don't even try to go there, you know. I, but and but I, don't I don't know. know maybe turning maybe turning a blind eye is good enough. I, yeah, I, I don't I think even know I, the current. I'm a withdrawn equity actor at this moment, so I, I, I am too. I'm not, technically. I'm not current, but uh, and don't pretend to speak currently. Yeah, and sorry about that. But yeah. um, but a blind eye isn't. I don't feel comfortable with that because I don't either. I want people them to are not don't feel free to do things. They don't know when something's going to crack down. They don't know. To me, I've always felt that the rules are complex, often different by, certainly by you levels by of work, contract, by contract, yeah. maybe even by location. It's so complex that, you know, people don't think creatively because there is so much. I would just throw out one other aspect we haven't discussed. Um, the global one is big in my mind, but beyond that, if you think how theater is developing and um, You've heard the old coffee bean analogy, right? What's that? Theater and the coffee bean. This no, is all. I don't this think is, so. The, this probably. This has been repeated many times, uh, and I'll no doubt screw it up right now. Uh, but <laughs> That's okay. If, uh, up until the present moment, you can kind of equate the development of theater with the development of the coffee bean. So it started out, you had people just kind of doing their own thing. You had the coffee bean. The point was the product. Just, uh, just the there it was, the bean, and, and people would sit at home and, and strum their ukulele or whatever. Then things evolved. We're talking going back over the century now or whatever. Uh, and you had uh, a service economy as, no, a distribution economy as in Folgers or Chase and Sanborn or whatever. And mm -hmm. there began to be theaters would tour and you would have some kind of reaching people. Then it kind of evolved in the coffee bean industry, I believe, to a um, service economy, as I had previously said, which you could equate to uh, Dunkin' Donuts, where you know people are coming and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we began to build theaters that were residence-based mm -hmm. and served, um, you know, a community. It was we were putting on plays, we were giving the the community plays, we were providing that service, a charitable service. Okay, then the coffee bean, you know what the next stage of the coffee bean was. Um, uh, Starbucks, which one can define as, a, it was big because it was an experience. Mm -hmm. you, you went there for the experience of being at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. So theater began always later than the other industries. It kind mm -hmm. of began to get that. We think, oh, okay, we need to be experience-based and we'd start doing more with lobby displays or maybe people are hanging out at the coffee bar where you would go to the theater and it would be an experience. Mm -hmm. But we're now not in necessarily in theater, but the world, and the coffee bean analogy kind of falls off here, I have to admit. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the world has kind of now moved, one, a lot of people would say, into uh, beyond experience into a participatory realm where the point is in theater, it's not to how do you get people into the audience, how do you build your audience, it's how do you connect with people that will be your audience? How do you build an impactful connection with people where they are deeply, they're participating in the organization, they're engaged, 
where maybe engaging their own creativity, they are not passive receivers, they are actively involved. And that, the, the theater companies that are really doing exciting work, I mean, there are many possible manifestations of this, but a lot of them are really engaging on that level. New, deeper, different kinds of connection with community where the community is creatively engaged and collaborating. Mm -hmm. Well, if one posits that that's kind of the way forward, I think it is, uh, you've got a, one of the biggest tools, and it's not certainly the only tool, I mean, theater's an in-person art, mm -hmm. but it's digital. I mean, you've got, that's one of the ways you can really engage people mm -hmm. by uh, having them involved with the artists, with the creative material, mm -hmm. with where you are in development, with all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Like every aspect that yes. they're participating yes. in. Very, yes, very, like yes. Like an expansion beyond the post-play discussion, if you will. That they're actually. I remember we did this thing. We did David, um, David Edgar's uh, Pentecost at the Old Globe, which is a, an amazing play, but it, there are many, many languages that are part of the script of Pentecost. Um, it's about a world in turmoil, at war, Many refugees take sanctuary in a in a cathedral, an abandoned cathedral, in which a, a priceless uh, antiquity, a fresco, is discovered on the wall. And by the end of it, the fresco is destroyed; it's bombed. But there's all these refugees that are uh, have taken refuge in the church, and they speak many different languages. And I remember we were putting it up at the Old Globe. I had actually stage managed the American premiere of it at, at Yale. Uh, I think I forget if it was Stan or Liz, I can't remember who the director was, but now I was producing it, and um, for a San Diego audience, which is not, you know, which is a, I mean, it is a city San Diego, it's no longer a sleepy beach town, but it's not really cosmopolitan, it's not, it's not, inter well, I don't know, at the time we were producing it, it wasn't so much of an international city, and I really wanted to make it accessible for people, and I wanted that kind of participatory thing, um, and we did a whole bunch of stuff, sort of pre-show, uh, interactions in the lobby to help people f become more familiar with what the various cultures were that were in the play so that they weren't just uh, able to relate to the white you know uh, priest or whatever but also you know the Iraqi you know uh, young child and what that culture would have been like because the play is about the, cr the clash of all those cultures and where's the meeting ground and you know it is art actually the meeting ground in a way? I, I'm sure, please forgive me, David Edgar, if I'm whatever, uh, simplifying your play beyond, beyond understandability. But, but anyway, the point being, like that to me was really important, you know, and we have the tools to do that. And I guess that's the thing, is that we need the tools to reach people and to in, in, include a, a more diverse and larger audience than just our local population. Like the Inch Festival this year, we are, we are making an effort to be out there and to be accessible, not just right here with HowlRound and, and on the internet, but downtown in our very, you know, independence downtown, writers are working in public to interact with the local locals to show that, you know, the art of writing, even though it usually is a very, it's very private and solitary art, that there are writers everywhere among us. I wanted to kind of demystify that act and, and put people out there to encourage the young people around us who might have an interest in creative writing, that it actually is a thing they could just sit down and do, just like they're seeing all these people sit down and do. Well, we're doing that because we have laptops and we have flat screens and I can actually, sh we can show what writers are working on as they're working on it in real time. So, I mean, that's kind of a simplified digital thing. But, but to me, it was, uh, that is a participant, now they can kind of participate and see what that creative act is like. Um, yeah, so yes. Thank you for such a wonderful, enlightening discussion. Um, so in light of this, this interesting comment that you made, important comment about reaching out to a participatory audience and diversifying, um, as we consider the future of American theater, of course, something we, that we might all agree on, I suspect, the future depends on the generations really beneath most of us, or younger than most of us in this room. So, who are wholly, seem to me anyways, uh, as being mightily dependent on digital media and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, 
what are some ways that we might um, perhaps, I don't know if this question could be certainly answered in our discussion today, but it comes, it comes to mind just in the light of what you've talked about, what you guys have talked about. What are some ways that we can use the digital media to encourage, um, inspire, if you will, uh, younger generations of all um, racial and ethnic and, and social class backgrounds to get, in, to get interested in the theater and to come to it, mm -hmm. without which I think the future I'm not a social media expert, so I, I may not be able to answer very directly, but I think you're, you're really hitting on the challenge, and there, there are, putting it in a larger construct again, I love the thought that if you do think back, not, well, really to the prior century or further back, everybody was engaged because that's all there was you know people there were little theatricals and people had stages in their living rooms and everybody told stories and sang and and I don't think we realize how huge an event the development of the light bulb was because it was I mean in the whole history of theater it may be the biggest event I mean um, modern mm -hmm. because all of a sudden once we had the theater lit the uh, it was what was happening on stage, that was where it was, and the, everyone was cast into darkness and passivity in the audience. And they slowly mm -hmm. and quickly began to internalize that they were to be polite, be respectful. Um, they no longer threw tomatoes and eggs as they <laughs> had in prior times. Um, but it meant that they were, they were listening to the elite who were giving them the benefits of culture. This has all to do with high culture, low culture, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. mass, popular, all, you know, are we thinking of culture laterally or is it, we've been thinking of it up and down. Is that really the way to think about it going forward? Uh, um, so now with, with digital everything, um, and again, this is a widely discussed concept, mm -hmm. the means of creation of work and both production and distribution. I mean, you can, somebody mm -hmm. can put some, something on YouTube and get it out there just as they can publish their own book or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so where everybody in the past for, for decades and decades has been reliant on the gatekeepers Mm -hmm. be it the big theaters or whoever. Now, an entrepreneurial, you know, creative artist, they can do whatever they want, really, if they know how to. They can make the work, they can get it out, they can build an audience, and... Right, uh, we, we are all makers now. Right. There and, is no separation in a way. And yet I we still have our theaters, artists. not all of them, a lot of them really get this. But, mm -hmm. I think but, so uh, but a lot of others may not. Mm -hmm. And so you, some are still operating on this old perspective that you have people just sitting in the audience. And I don't think the younger generation is interested in that. They want to be much more actively engaged. And there are many manifestations of how to do that. I mean, some of them involving sophisticated social media, but others just... If, if you do s surveys about what do people want from the theater, I think we're coming more and more to know what they really want is for it to matter to them. You know, it has to have meaning to them and they want to be able to connect with each other. It needs to be a social, if not social, maybe social is not, they want to be able to talk about it, to engage with other people, to be part of this. They don't want to just come and... They want a very... My, my experience is that they're looking for a very rigorous experience. And that is... That they're, that they're a part people. of. Yeah, that they're a part of. Not That they're, they're not watching their, their of it. Yeah. I mean, you are of this generation. Yeah, so I mean, I think there are a couple I mean, he, things. You know, you said, you said I, you know, as, right, opposed, are, but, as someone who is definitely part of this generation, like, I will say, uh, dis, I see a lot of theater because I work in theater and people give me comps and then I go see their shows out, out of obligation, quite frankly. But, like, I do not see theater by choice, particularly. And because I would, why? Because what? it's mostly boring and it's often not very good. Um, and because, uh, you know... Right now, we happen to be living in a period of like the greatest growth in television storytelling that has really come about since like the dawn of television. Like 
it is having this renaissance. There are amazing TV shows out there. And so, like, I can go watch House of Cards. Mostly written by playwrights. And often, mm. yeah. And mm. actually, uh, to plug my workshop tomorrow, I'll talk a lot about the crossover between playwrights and screenwriters and what the effect on both uh, television and theater that has had. Um, but I think, you know, I can stay home and watch, like, really amazing acting and really amazing design and really amazing storytelling and also, you know, have my choice of snacks and my, <laughs> and my bad. Yeah, um, that's, the, that's the real challenge. Right. And you're talking about a group of people, young people, who are screen addicted, and it's very hard when what is on the screens. I agree with you entirely. I have a very good friend who's probably the best scholar of American drama in the world who says the best American drama in the world is in television. Uh, now. Breaking Bad is The mm -hmm. Wire is mm -hmm. all of those series are better written than the majority of what you see on the stage. Now there are exceptions. Mm -hmm. When you have that situation combined with the fact that getting a generation that wants to look at screens into a situation where we can introduce them to live theater, mm -hmm. that's a really big challenge. Yeah, and I mean I think especially like when you Steve, look um, when you look at people like who who work in theater like I do, day in and day out, and who are of this generation, like uh, it's our choice, and I would say my general not going to theater is highly representative of all the other people I know who work in theater and are you know in the like thirty five and below age category. It's it's a choice that is not made due to a lack of exposure to what theater has to offer. Like, obviously, we've, like, chosen to go get our BFAs in theater and to work in theater all the time. So, like, we know what it has to offer and are still choosing not to go, which I think is even, like, even more illuminating. Um, it's, not, it's not a question of getting us in the door. You know, we can, well, we can get in the door. cost is one factor. Cost is one factor, yeah, for sure. And actually, I think cost has sort of a broader issue, which is that the cost for people to produce films and television... Um, to produce uh, recorded visual material that has the production value and finesse of what we expect from sort of commercially produced material, that cost has come so far down over the past couple decades. Um, whereas the cost to produce uh, live stage performances that look like what we expect that to look like has gone so far up. So there's been this sort of weird inverse cost thing where I can now go out and buy a camera for, you know, maybe $10,000 that is the same camera that's being used to shoot feature films. I can, like, use the web as a resource to learn how to use it. Um, I can, you know, have digital editing and digital animation and sort of post-production tools that are the same people, the same that professionals are using, accessible to me for, you know, free if you have a student discount. Um, whereas the film and television has really driven up people's expectation of what production value should be. So, you know, you see these action movies, and now in theater, we have to have special effects that look like what films have. And so theater has just gotten more and more and more expensive and complicated and technically rigorous to sort of produce things that look like what people are expecting. And so it's gotten actually much harder for, like, a school group to do something that sort of looks like what people are expecting it to look like. Because we've we've grown an audience that has a certain expectation. Right, and I mean? think, yeah, no, I think there's this, like, you see it sort of in a very literal way <laughs> in that, like, if you go look at a show like Phantom of the Opera, which the lighting design hasn't changed since that show was originally created, it's much, like, dimmer than a show is now. Mm -hmm. And so, like, just in lighting, like all of a sudden, we get used to one level of brightness and then they have to sort of amplify it a little bit and then everyone gets used to that. It's the same if you put on headphones, you know, you end up slowly turning the volume up over like two hours of listening because you just sort of get acclimated to it. That happens to everyone with visual spectacle over, you know, decades. And so when you go, when, like, when we go back and look at these sort of old pictures, we're like, oh man, like how did, or even if you go back and look at a movie from 20 years ago, mm -hmm. you're like, did people really, like, buy that special effect? Like, I can see how they did that. That's ridiculous. Well, we did, did that Wizard of Oz uh, in, in No, December. of course. Right, exactly. That yeah. was, that's a great example. Like, we went back and looked at Wizard of Oz, and I was like, oh, you can, like, like this was, like, done so badly by modern standards. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but yet you choose to make work in the theater. So even if you don't go to it, you yeah, you've made a choice. The to people use are much your... more fun to work with. Oh, is that it? it? No, that is actually. <laughs> I think I think that's a big part of it. Honestly, is like I the, I think that people who work in theater are like some of the most interesting artistic people. And mm -hmm. as a group, I think you know we're failing in really big ways. But but it's really awesome to work with the people. And and I think there is good work getting done. But it's it's really hard. Would you agree that the from a design perspective uh, that you're speaking about, that there's been such a just ground shift in terms of, I mean, we used to talk about, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that sets were the thing. Mm -hmm. And sets mm -hmm. kind of go by the by, not totally, but to some extent, significantly replaced by design elements, lighting, sound design, whatever. I mean, so it seems, at which puts a much greater creative possibility, but also demand in terms of design, but it's as if that has sort of uh, shifted away from what we used to think of as a theater project. Hasn't that just changed Well, it's interesting. There, there, we'll, we'll take your questions just a second. There, there are two productions from New York that I've seen within, I don't know, a couple of decades, I would say, like Wendell Harrington's work on how to succeed in business, for instance, and, um, and then, uh, forgive me, uh, uh, the Johnny, the musical that was an ensemble, but it was all Johnny Cash's music. Uh, Ring of Fire. Ring of Fire, Fire. Thank you. You look at those two things, and and how to succeed in business. The 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 one that Wendell did, Matthew Broderick starred in Broadway. It definitely used projection as a design element, changing your orientation to the scale of the thing, essentially. Um, and then you look at something like Ring of Fire, but there were there were there was three dimensional scenery. Wendell was projecting within as part of that environment. And it was about, or like Julie Taymor and Sp uh, Spider-Man, for instance, uh, George Sippen's set, you know, changing your perspective greatly. And they were utilizing projection in that way. But then you look at something like Ring of Fire that had no set, really. All, it was only projection. Um, and that, that is a real ground shift. I don't, I don't personally find it as satisfying as both, like utilizing both, yeah. like we're, we're using... In, in the creation of Donald's tribute, uh, we are Matthew. We're not only projecting interviews and still images from his work and his life, but we are also using projection scenically, but within a set. Like we're we're not doing one at the expense of the other. We're using all of that to make a sort of much more dimensional and 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 um, a more complicated environment that I think is. Uh, what his work calls for. Yeah, and I mean, again, I'll talk about this a lot tomorrow during the workshop on, on media in theater, but um, I think a big part of it is, like, we've got television that's being influenced because it's playwrights going over to right there, but then they're coming back and still writing plays, but now they now have the sensibility because they've been working in film where you can write, like, 200 locations into your movie and you can, you know, bump between them with, like, no consequences logistically. Um, and they... And I get these scripts, and again, like I almost exclusively do new work, and I exclusively do new work that calls for projection because I'm a projection designer. So I get these scripts that'll be like, it'll be a play, and it'll be in 90 minutes, and there'll be like 32 locations in it. And the playwright hasn't put any effort into figuring out how that's going to exist on stage beyond writing what they want those locations to be. And so, you know, you look at like, a Shakespeare thing where like in the first 14 lines of Hamlet we know that it's like a, you know a freezing cold midnight in Denmark um, and we know that because the characters you know say that in in various ways and then you look at like any new play um, even really awesomely written ones like really amazingly written plays there's no effort that I'm seeing to expose what our environment is and so then we as like directors and design team get these pieces of text and it's been left entirely to us to tell the audience where we are. And when we are moving through so many locations that, you know, with all the money in the world, we couldn't cram 32 unit sets into a theater. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, okay, we should probably use projection, I guess. Like, you know, which is not necessarily very interesting, but. Which has to do a lot also just with the kind of work being produced. Think how recently, uh, so many times, uh, 
maybe a Latino work would be rejected because they say, oh, it's, you know, magic realism and mm -hmm. an audience isn't going to be able to quite get that. And, you know, first we're here and all of a sudden magically it's over here. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what's happening now all the time. Oh, yeah, Everything yeah, you just described. Regarding. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Philip. I can, well, just to your point, uh, I just uh, saw a wonderful production of a new play in Miami called Cuban Spring. Mm -hmm. And it does take place in Fantasyland and in the hall. Mm -hmm. And it worked beautifully on a set that was probably no bigger than this room. Mm -hmm. The stage in this area. The second, the other, one's an observation. 60 years ago when television started to hit the market, movies went crazy trying to beat television because everybody was staying home and not going out and spending a buck and a half to go to the movies. So mm -hmm. They were going to stay home and watch New Girl. Mm -hmm. So they went to all the, they went to television. They went to the 3D. It didn't help the product at all. The product actually just stayed the same or even got Worse because they were worried about production values, but mm -hmm. television and film learned to coexist and realize they were after different markets. Mm -hmm. And the point that I come to with that is, is look at the Lion King is running forever on Broadway. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different. How many people who have seen the Lion King on Broadway also saw the film? Mm -hmm. So they are learning to differentiate that. And I think looking at the idea of and, and on the third tangent. So we should get we should give our audience more credit. You may think the, the perhaps sense, we have to say, they know they're going to the theater. They know they're not going to see the movie. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll bet you there are people who say, well, this is different than the movie was. Yes, but that's going to be a very small. They're looking. I hope they're looking for a new adventure when they go see mm -hmm. The Lion King or go see Spider Man. You know, Spider Man. The challenges that Spider Man faced. If it didn't face all those challenges, I wonder how it would have worked. But mm -hmm. the, the third thing I come around to in this is that you have. When you have something like a playwright who's writing 35 different locations, you obviously can tell, well, this person is, maybe they'd be better off writing a screenplay. Mm -hmm. And say, this is going to make, this would make a wonderful film, but if you're turning all of your messaging over to the set design, you're giving up a great deal of your job as a playwright. But is that, a, I, I, I would argue that that's not a bad thing. That's just a different kind of creative collaboration. I'm not it is. I'm just, but I'm saying that you're, you're, you're changing the, you're changing the bound, you're changing the collaboration, which is not a bad thing, but it's putting a different perspective on but, it. But well, in the also, US, we focus so much on playwrights in Europe, they, or they focus on directors really mm -hmm. more. And well, now designers are getting writing, but I, but well, I, but, but I also think, also like for me, the I feel like my work is interpretive, unless it's something like like Lee. But you you devise work. You you create it all together. I take it. I didn't get to take your workshop, sadly, because I was in, in another one. But I, um, but I, I feel like the creative act is in the writing, uh, and that I'm in my my work is more of an interpretive. I I, I am collaborative, and I'm a very. Um, I'm, I'm the dramaturg that Lloyd Richards tutelage made me, I guess I should say. Uh, and so I do have a real rigor in the dramaturgy of it, but that's what I feel like is part of my job. I feel like, uh, yeah, you, know, you, you yeah. know, everybody but I, I've talked to this year says it's the most exciting piece of theater in New York on Broadway, anyway, is The Curious Incident in New York, which is a completely, totally theatrical experience. Yes. I, mean, I read that novel. And uh, that could not exist anywhere except in the theater. Correct. And in terms of what you're talking about, it takes place all over the place. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, I mean, the irony is, of course, it's a bare stage, which is transformed into every conceivable environment. Exactly. And that is a show, as I watched it a couple of weeks ago, uh, that could not have been done Ten years ago, even. No. I mean, yeah. even when they had the capability of doing some of those things, they wouldn't have conceived it that way. Mm -hmm. So, along with what Philip is saying, and believe me, I'm the biggest naysayer about theater audiences and the future of the theater you can imagine. People do adapt, and people mm -hmm. do both within and you know what within the theater and mm -hmm. what the audience. I mean. I can't, I mean, I am sure every single performance of The Curious Incident of the Dog ends with a standing ovation. I think so. Absolutely. It's when also, stand, but it also. Standing O's are a dime a dozen these days. But, those are all but it's people more who had no idea what they were going to see when they went in there. I mm -hmm. had read the novel, I'd been mm -hmm. on the radio talking about the novel, so I knew what the story was. Mm -hmm. These are people, as you know, 
particularly at certain times on Broadway, who just go to a show because it's there. And they have been exposed to perhaps the most kind of complete kind of theatrical experience you can have, mm -hmm. and they love it. Mm -hmm. And, and that, it utilizes all the things you guys are talking about, and yet is still theater. Yes, but and, and a very expensive production too, mind you. Sure, yeah. that is a that is a huge price to get that production. I, I I also think you know you could have a thirty-two uh, setting play that you don't need all that no, expense I mean, to do, deliver you either. Do regional theater can do, uh, and even small theater can do what Curious Incident of the Dog does theatrically, maybe not on the same scale. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is the reimagining of what theater can and is mm -hmm. based on a lot of the technical stuff that you guys are talking about mm -hmm. that reconceives the whole notion of theater. That can be done for millions of dollars. It can be done for less money. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's actually a reconception at all. And I think you sort of hit something very early in what you're saying, which is like, to me, the shows that should be being done in theater are the pieces of storytelling that can only work in theater. Right. And I think, you know, what is making the really, the television that's happening right now so amazing is there's a group of writers who have sort of realized, okay, here are all these things we can do in this serialized format that we can't do in film. Mm -hmm. And that's why you end up with, you know, amazing writers and actors who, until a couple years ago, never would have, like, lowered themselves to do television. They're, you know, off doing feature films, who are now sort of seizing this opportunity. To tell a longer to tell, story. A, yeah, to tell stories that they could only tell in this long format, mm -hmm. which they couldn't make as a movie. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the same conversation and the same sort of thought process needs to happen with playwrights, especially, is, like, should this actually be a play... Should it be a screenplay? And if it's going to be a play, like, why is it going to be a play? Like, why isn't it going to be a novel? Why isn't it going to be, a, like, a concept album? You know, what is it about this story and, or how I want to tell this story that needs to live on stage? And I don't actually think the sort of, like, rise of scenic automation and projection, like, all the very expensive toys we have these days, like, actually has or should change the, like, fundamental core of like why you do things on a stage versus why you do things on a screen. That's a good point, but I also think there's another element that comes into it in that I've seen some really, really good films made out of really bad books and vice versa. Yeah. So it tells me that this should have stayed as it was. And I'm I did not see the, the recent film of the Great Gatsby, so I can't comment on that. Mm. I hear it's I have had people tell me people who are very strict about their their, their Fitzgerald say they liked it and they mm -hmm. loved it. The only Gatsby I've seen besides the I saw the Alan Land one, but I think from nineteen forty mm. whatever, forty nine. Forty nine. And then the one with mm. the lifeless one with Robert Redford and oh, Pharaoh. Yeah. And it proved that proved to me that yeah, you cannot make this book into a movie very easily. Very mm -hmm. tough to do. Mm -hmm. So there's that there's that part of when we said something about is this a play or is this Writer seems to play this in all the time, and I have to decide. Mm -hmm. and it tells, I have to listen to what the characters tell me first. Right, right. So I think the, the one thing that is interesting this idea of do I take a, a play and stretch it out over two or three? Forget Peter Jackson, but do I take an idea and stretch it out over two or three films or mm -hmm. in television? Stephen Boschko did it 25, 30, 40 years ago with mm -hmm. Healthy Blues mm -hmm. and did that. He had a story arc that started in one episode continued in the middle in the second episode and another arc started and he, he kicked the yeah. right the, 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 the story also wrote for history blues project. Yeah. right right and the story arcs leapfrogging right. luke you had a question i'm sorry i think That's and i okay. didn't i skipped um, on it a couple of different things first of all relating to this from a very personal uh standpoint um as a playwright who also is trying to break into film and television mm -hmm. i find myself writing my plays very cinematically. Mm -hmm. uh, the play I just did uh, utilized a lot of projections. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to, but that was how this first production was done, so that then not only does it work theatrically as a play for a modern audience, but also it's something where people are saying, I can see how this would work as a film. Mm -hmm. So you know, that, to coin a phrase, doubles my chances for a date on Saturday night. Right, exactly. <laughs> 
Um, and another question I had that is unrelated, but along the lines of social media, at the risk of sounding like a dinosaur, probably a question for you, Matthew, could someone please explain to me the value of Twitter? Oh, you know, well. I, I totally get, you know, all these people are saying, you know, you have to have a presence on Twitter, you mm -hmm. have to have a, a total, you know, I just, personally, I don't see the value in it. So, and if someone I'll speak to that. explain that to I'll, I'll speak I to don't that. have a Twitter, I'll, so Karen I'll, can I'll, cover I'll, that one. He, he's, 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 a, he's an odd duck, I see. Um, I, I am on, uh, not only am I on Twitter and Instagram and Tumblr and Facebook, I have a love-hate relationship with, with Facebook, frankly. I, I came to those medium very early on by younger people in my life who opened my eyes to them, and I saw them as an opportunity to help connect with an audience, or uh, first an audience of my friends, and then my friends expanded to colleagues, and then my colleagues expanded to audience people who were following my work, actually. Um, and that was interesting to be connected to audience with nobody, no middle person in between us. And for me, being a news junkie as I am, um, my favorite thing about Twitter is there's nobody between me and the newsmaker. So I can tweet to an astronaut who has just taken off in space, and he'll answer me. There's nobody in between us. And that's a phenomenal, uh, again, Twitter has started most of the recent revolutions. Yeah, yes, exactly. Um, and kept, and kept those, those, uh, element, those people who are, you know, trying to overthrow or trying to come together, connect it or enable them to connect in any way, you know. Um, so I find it amazing. Um, and it's, it's brought me to a much more, I mean, I've worked all over the country. And now I have audience all over the country. I mean, you, you work many, many different places. And Twitter enables me to stay connected to them. Um, for instance, the reason I have my phone here is I am tweeting about the Inch Festival and the panel while we're on it um, to engage in a dialogue with people who are, like for instance, the panel this morning, we had a couple of people from Ireland who were watching. And uh, we got a question from them. And so you know, we were able to have uh, serve as a resource, but you know, because we also talked about resources available to playwrights to get premieres on, for instance. Um, so to me, it's a, a, a very, very interesting way of connecting. But it's but it's catch as catch can. Twitter, you know, because it's a constant feed. You either see it or you don't. It's gone, you know, unless you check back in on somebody's uh, Twitter page, so to speak, and see what they tweeted, you know. But for instance, I think. I think I either found you on Twitter or on Facebook when I first asked you, not, not this time, but on some other occasion, would you come? Um, and that's how we first got connected, mm -hmm. even though I've been an admirer of your work for a long time. So mm -hmm. to me, that's what those social media enable me to do. Um, well, and, and yet, they require maintenance, they require time you know, and resources, and you have to keep at it. Like I brought on two interns for the in festival this, this weekend to tweet and uh, you know, Snapchat for us. We have Inch Snaps, which is what all the young people, even younger than even younger than Matthew, um, are you know, in the colleges are using Snapchat, and that's a very visual medium, and it's a dialogue that's just image related. And with a snap, you you throw up a, an Inch Snap, for instance. When you open it, it's gone in ten seconds. So it's it's a very fast and ever changing medium. And I'm not quite sure how to use that. So I'm like you are with Twitter. I'm like that with Snapchat. Like, really? But it's going to be gone. There's going to be like no trail of it. Like not even the, you know, when a, when a jet shoots through the sky and there's all the, you know, the after uh, the flow of the jet fuel or whatever, there will be no trace of Snapchat unless you create a my story, whatever that is. And when you open <laughs> Snapchat, it's all icons with no explanation. So I had to have lovely Annabelle Howard, who is acting as our camera woman for our live stream. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, she had to explain Snapchat, and she set up in Snaps for us, and she's the one doing the, the uploads, you know. But these are ways, these are access points. I mean, do you but, do you do all of this? Do you do any of this? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I do some of it. I, I, uh, but yeah, I I I'm not I'm not actually that facile with it. So yeah, I, I, I do a little bit of it, but not um, so much business related as. Just and in a way, you know, it's interesting because you're you have an incredible process that is very uniquely your own, that is mysterious to me, and I wish I knew more about. You know, 
but but there's you know you've made a choice to sort of like that's my that's a process that I do in this arena or whatever you know creating work but isn't does you do not want it to be completely accessible you want to create and then share you know whereas you know some of what we've talked about is people want to be engaged in the process you know when I uh, the last couple of things that I've uh, and, and I felt this too as a producer like with donors you know donors giving us oodles of money to put on work um, and uh, I've just tried to open up the process a little bit for them so that they see what it is they're enabling and yet not in such a way as to, you know, affect or yeah. adversely affect the actual act of creation, you know. So I think some of these media enable that kind of work. Uh, and certainly they are great marketing tools because this is the first time that the Inch Festival, that anything at the Inch Festival is seen beyond Independence, Kansas today. And that was incredibly exciting to say, you know, we were talking about the premier conundrum and the issue of development to production. And, you know, Donald's had his, his plays where they've, you know, not been sort of, not, not been a, not worked in their first production and, you know, had to strive to get a second one. Well, t for people on the net to see Donald or hear Donald talk about that kind of experience is extraordinary. So these, a these are all access points to me, and that's really what Twitter is about. And, and on Twitter, you can follow sort of any, any event or any conference or whatever. They, every conference, every event sort of chooses a hashtag, like number sign, right? And ours is I-N-G-E-F-E-S-T. So to the entire company here, I said, as you're here and you're taking selfies, which, you know, we probably should do that, but I'm not so good at that. Um, uh, or little vines, these little short videos. When you upload them, you know, like them, which is the going thing, right? Um, but more importantly, share them and use hashtag InchFest, and then our name gets more and more out there. So that's that's yeah. the way I see it. It's really it. interesting that 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 uh, you read about it that people on the if we're on the wrong side, the right, or at least the other side of the digital divide. Well, I would, the, I would I'm consider on myself side. on the other side. I mean, I'm older but, than uh, you, and whatever. Well, but, any, um, anyway, for those on the young side of the digital divide, uh, you know, people say they literally experience much of the world and everything they're interacting with, but specifically theater, completely differently. I mean, we, me, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, for most of us, theater it was sort of, it, linear. It was narrative. Mm -hmm. It had mm -hmm. it it had a certain track. Um, that's just not true for many young people. Where it's uh, much more, it's it's fast, it's interactive, it's collage, it's whatever it is. It's uh, a whole different way of experiencing. There's somebody who writes about this really interesting. Her name is Kathleen Hall Jameson, and she mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she writes about how people are experiencing this work. Um, but that affects both the kind of work you're doing and, but we were talking about uh, what kind of work should, is properly or to its best advantage a film or, or TV or, but you think about it, if, if people are watching Homeland, that's kind of become the Ed Sullivan or you know, something like it of, of past years where mm -hmm. everyone sees it and to some extent they can share that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's almost around the coffee cooler or whatever, or water cooler. Um, but on the other hand, you come back to theater and it is still only theater where people mm -hmm. can come together after the production and argue and talk and mm -hmm. right. everybody may have right. seen the same thing on Homeland. And that's great, I mean, you know, you talk about it, it, it creates our, our national ethos in a sense and mm -hmm. you can't discount that mm -hmm. but it still doesn't really allow people to just come together and argue it out and whatever mm -hmm. whatever and people want i think people want that no, I, agree. I, I mean, mean it's, it's not like I either also, or i mean those are both good things that's not true people argue about homeland just <laughs> that's true I mean, the question I have to but not they're not all together in a group to do it well all right. they can sit all right together. i mean what I have, the question I have for you, Matthew, is assuming, and I, I'm not a tech theater person, so I yield to you in that, that the capabilities of theater are greater now than they have been. The 
let's say, mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years. In terms of technical things you can do on a state, would you grant that? Yes, but I would say that the that uh, that our technical capabilities has uh, expanded does not necessarily mean that the capabilities of the art form has have expanded or changed. I, I draw a distinction there. And I I'm, would I'm definitely happy. say the art form has expanded and changed in but 30 I, years. Yeah. But, I, but yeah. I don't there think... There are many I don't think, artists who have really but moved the art form I don't think in a projection very... designers are a big component of that, honestly. Would oh, be my... Well, would be my. I, I well it's a different, it's a different tool at, of storytelling. Right. I'm getting at, Matthew, the hardest thing, you know, I, I, I taught theater in the English department for many, many years. The hardest thing to get literature students to understand is theater is theater as well as text. In other words, it's something that mm, happens. Yes. I mean, that here's where I think the big difference is. It's something that happens live that cannot be replicated in any other way. Exactly. And what I'm asking you guys isn't the ability to enhance that experience, that live experience, been improved in, or changed in certain ways over 30 years. Definitely, so, definitely been changed, yeah. yeah and definitely. So therefore, the kind of thing we're talking about in terms of the theatrical experience has been a great asset to theater as theatrical experience. Now, what Karen is talking about is a whole different area where there are no obstacles to having people in Australia see what we're doing. Mm -hmm. There well, and this, was, I, and this was a joint, you know, the thing that HowlRound did was a joint performance. This was not just watching, I, I mean, I'm not exactly sure how they did it, but they could all interact and, and they were sort of working with each other in three different states, if you will. I mean, and a number see, of people are doing you know, that. They're documenting get, Lots of people are doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I hate to get back to the not curious lots, incident, but. but it's such a good example. Yeah. As I was sitting there, I was thinking, how, how inclusive that experience is now in a way that it wasn't, it wouldn't have been inclusive a while ago. In other words, that it included a whole lot of people, some of the people that Gigi is talking about, uh, who come to theater with different expectations now and yet are satisfied in that situation by an experience Luke saw it recently too, where you know, we as old time theater guys can still appreciate it. Yeah. And the inclusiveness of an experience like that, I find very exciting. Do you, do you understand what well, I Well, mean? the wonderful thing about Curious uh, Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime is that although it uses incredible technology to achieve the, the creation of the world, if you will, that it exists within, it still is a very, very human story and it's still about human interaction as all great theater is, you know, and um, you transcend somehow the technology. Like you're using the technology, you're quite aware of it, um, uh, and yet you kind of suspend your disbelief into it. You, you release into it, and you take that world on, you, you allow yourself to get immersed in it. But I think you allow yourself to get immersed in it because of the human well, I mean, element, the event. Well, it's beautifully directed. Show. Yes, it is. And a Indeed. lot of what happens in the curious is the dog has nothing whatsoever to do with technology. I mean, just the yes, right. movement of bodies around the stage and the stage pictures that are made uh, to represent certain things mm -hmm. could have been done a hundred years ago by an inventive mm -hmm. director. But it's the Truly. building of all those things. I mean, that's is, exciting to me. Yeah, you know, exactly yeah. Very exciting. I mean, look, I think, well, I think there's two things. One is, I think, like, at its core, theater is we've got an audience, we've got actors on stage. Everything else is, I think, ultimately optional. Not necessarily for a given piece of text is it optional. But overall, you know, we can cut off the set and the lighting and the costumes and the projection. The actors don't even have to be and, on stage. And, oh, right. <laughs> I'm sorry. We can cut out all of those things, and we still have <laughs> we still have actors, and we have an audience, and we have some sort of space that they are existing in simultaneously. And that's the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and then all the other stuff we add, you know, helps or hurts depending on the piece, but but is additional. But I think there's sort of we've been having two separate conversations about intertwining them, which is there's sort of media as it is part of theater, which is a, a great conversation, and then there's also media as it is used as an audience building tool, which we like sort yeah, of drifted yeah. in. And I think, you know, we, 
specifically on the latter point, that's an area where the theater industry, I do think, has not done a very good job keeping up with like nearly every other industry. And like my company works a lot with companies in the fashion industry, like a lot of makeup brands and clothing brands. And that's an industry that like they have gotten very, very good. And they weren't always very good at this, but they've gotten very good over the past several years of like understanding how to create an experience for their audience, which is their customers, um, that allows them to feel connected to these brands. And because of that, they buy more clothing. So, you know, we do all these things like I went out and did this Armani GQ Grammy after party thing. And so basically there's a giant room and they've got lots of celebrities having a fun time. And then there's a whole nother room that is like people uh, who are like live tweeting it and live sharing images. And I don't actually use any of these things. So I'll like, I'm not even totally clear on what they all do, but someone. He doesn't use is, any of this. Stuff. I have Facebook, but that's it. Um, <laughs> but the point is like, you know, they're creating these experiences and then inviting audiences uh, into it for the purpose of selling clothing. Mm -hmm. And they're inviting audiences into sort of an experience, whether or not it's a really particularly accurate one, of the process that like these clothes get designed. So there's all these like open studio videos that they make about like the design process and stuff like that. And that allows people, rather than feeling like a consumer, to feel like uh, a participant, as we were talking about. Oh, but and I, I have think, such a problem and with I, applying and that idea no, to the theater. No, it's a huge problem. So I, as a designer, <laughs> exactly. as a designer, don't do it. I don't want don't do it, right? I don't want producers meddling in my process. I sure as shit don't want a billion audience people meddling in my process. What? But, but I do think there's a difference between actually doing that and create an experience, which is ultimately a marketing idea, that lets people feel like you're doing that. And I do think in the latter area, there's room for improvement. But I'm curious to hear what you think, because I think we probably agree on the challenge and problem of, of actually opening up the process in that kind of way. Yeah, I just think that that process of creating an experience from a brand perspective is all about commodification. Mm -hmm. And it's so hollow. And I don't think, I think Nobody wants that. We've all been manipulated, yeah. told what to like, what to buy. Every day, every what we should have. But theater so is a commodity. Bombarded. I don't I, think it is a commodity. I think art is totally a commodity. But this is, I think, a I totally. Don't. I don't think it's a commodity. But what? So, I think this so is a totally about, different do you, conversation. Do you, yeah. do you use uh, media in your work? Do you use. Um, um, I have not used a lot of media in my work. I tend to be a little bit more on the Peter Brook empty space end mm -hmm. of the spectrum. And I work with incredible writers who are expanding the medium and reinventing what theater can be and how mm -hmm. it's relevant through form, structure, design, content, mm -hmm. in all kinds of different ways. I know incredible artists who do work with media mm -hmm. in completely experimental, mind-bending ways. Yes. So I just I think that theater is ritual. I think it's a sacred space. I think it's about people witnessing great vulnerability, and I do not think it should be treated as a commodity. Right, right. <clears throat> but you, but you, I mean, some of these artists do somehow manage to use these things oh, to course. a great end. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Because you're, you're actually being completely disingenuous, and I sort of asked him to be very <laughs> contentious in this, in this panel, because I was like, well, we sort of all agree. Because you have done this very thing. I mean, you know, the, Our Lady, for instance, where you... You're really pushing the sure. envelope of what that whole world and environment is, and you're using it. You're Absolutely, it but if no one shows up to Our Lady to see it, we yeah. haven't made theater. Right. James, the performer, and I have had a really fun collaborative process as a project and cost right. some regional yeah, theater I a bunch mean, of that's money. That's my question but, to you. You can be doing the greatest thing you want, and if nobody shows up, what yeah. difference my, does it make? And so, do you, I mean, believe me, I'm being contentious yeah. now, too, because yeah. I don't totally believe this, but. No. The end justifies the means to some extent. I mean, particularly today when we can't get people into the theaters at all. You know, if you have to perhaps <laughs> go against some of your principles, if at the end people will come in and have that experience, isn't it worth it? Sure, I'm not saying that people shouldn't try to communicate and make, a, um, invite people in, but I think as theaters like jump through hoops to try to figure out new ways to convince people that it's interesting, you know, 
theaters spend so much money on their advertising department and freelance artists don't get paid a living wage. So mm -hmm. I'm like, There's come on, like, a if lot you make, if you, but if you make, street. I think if when you make work that speaks to people, people come. And mm -hmm. sometimes you do it in a downtown theater where there's 25 seats, and sometimes you do it in a big theater, and sometimes it doesn't work. But I, I just, I, I, yeah, I just, I have a problem with it becoming all about selling a product mm -hmm. because it's too, it diminishes theater to be something that's about customer relations experience mm -hmm. and going to the theater should be challenging. Mm -hmm. It should expand your sense of humanity. It should deal with something, a controversial topic that you don't um, feel comfortable with. It, it should be expansive and customer relations is all about making you feel good, making you feel safe, of telling you how to fit in and we, I, I, I so think that all of that noise it, uh, has to be, and look, I'm not a producer, so maybe I shouldn't be the one qualified to talk about this, but <laughs> as an artist, I just find it like, I, I just, you know, I, I, don't, I don't diminish the value of finding new ways of connecting and outreach, but I, 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 but you I don't, don't think it should be treated like a commodity. I feel so strongly about that. That, that the actual point of connection is the thing, that it makes you feel, yeah. and that that's going to bring an audience no matter what. But it yeah. is, uh, I mean, we might all agree about the commodity aspect and about if it's just about marketing and so on. I oh, mean, well, it might, well, but perfect but example. Hand, where when, I, you know, when, we did, when I did the, the Efron's play, right? So, you know, Love Lost and What I Wore with Nora and Delia, we wanted to do it with as many great broads as possible. That was what it was about. I said to Nora, I don't want to lock the play. I don't want to like say this is the only way we're ever going to do the play because I want to remake the play with every great group of women that we gather. And, and that's what it was about. It, people perceived it as a marketing idea. It was never about that, mm -hmm. never. It was about showing how many different women could say this play and bring themselves to it and op keep opening the play up again and again to more and more examination. That was rich, right. and more and people came back, you know. So that, that and that wasn't marketing. That wasn't, but yet it was perceived as okay. like a and commodification. That, that's artistic. Yeah. Was, yeah. Sure, but, sure. but then that's even different from. I mean, Jackson's right that a lot some of the attendance figures are going down. However, mm -hmm. to the extent that they chart it, participation audiences wanting to be engaged directly with the process or with the artists or something or doing something being asked to contribute in some way themselves not to the work itself mm -hmm. but engaged is going up those numbers are going up dramatically so it it's not so much changing how we view the work per se but how do we view the audience and what does it what does it mean in terms of going forward in terms of what we're hoping for them and their experience, mm -hmm. maybe beyond the work, not in changing the work. That's all I think about, really, actually. When I go to tell a story, it's how am I going to affect them? Or me, like if it was me out there. Like, what's the most effective? I, mean, I think we're out of time, actually. Um, we're actually going to go um, out to the Playwrights Garden to do a little memorial for Marion Seldes, if you'd like mm. to join us. Thank you. Very thank, you thank you. Thank you. I've got to get you all to sign my poster. It's a venerable Aww. Aww. tradition. And I